listeners, and welcome back to another episode of the Master Your Business podcast. This is a place where we dive really deep into the strategies that drive success in the professional services world. I'm your host, Deirdre Martin, here to guide you through. Today, we've got an exceptional episode lined up. We're venturing into the heart of emotional connection in the business landscape with none other than the acclaimed Neve Hannon. Neve is a chartered psychologist and a professional coach, as well as an influential thought leader who has been empowering authentic leadership for years. She has dedicated her impressive career to nurturing senior leaders and enhancing organizational structures. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, folks. Neve's insights are grounded in real life interactions with thousands of individuals and major organizations. Her approach is all about unlocking potential and thriving, not just surviving, in our professional environments. And that includes in our businesses. Today, Neve will take us on a journey exploring the pivotal role of emotional connection in the workplace and with our clients. She'll uncover why embracing our emotions isn't just good for our mental health, which it is, but it's also a game changer for building trust nurturing engaged teams and yes you've guessed it for boosting your bottom line listen closely in this episode because neve really shares incredible wisdom on peeling back the layers of our emotions she talks about the art of mindful self-observation and strategies that help identify and communicate what our deepest feelings are in a more effective way So get ready for her three empowering tips that promise to revolutionize emotional connection in your business. Spoiler alert here, folks. It involves pausing, creating safe spaces, and bravely sharing our vulnerabilities. Now, I really wanted to bring you on here to build your business up tomorrow. That's why I wanted to bring Neve on. And what I mean by that is, today, as you're listening, you might be a solopreneur. Maybe you have some contractors or a VA, but maybe you have a team of five or 10 or more people. Either way, you, my friend, you could be the founder of a global organization that's in its infancy. And a company or organization or a business that's built upon a foundation where it's okay to talk about your emotions is in all the same. It helps foster trust, not just internally in your business, but externally with your clients. It creates a space where it's okay to feel crap if something goes wrong and be able to say that openly. And what's important is creating that space where you can have those conversations with clients. Oh my God, the impact of that is so profound. I kid you not. The skills Neve talks about are what many of us are missing, myself included. These are soft skills that some of us inherently have, but may not identify necessarily that we have them. But equally, they may be skills that we have that we are afraid to introduce into our businesses. And I promise you, by the end of our chat, you're going to be looking at your emotional world in a whole new light, a light that illuminates pathways to stronger, more authentic professional relationships internally in your business and externally with your clients, which ultimately leads to a thriving business environment. So whether you're on your daily commute, taking a break or penciling some me time, this is one conversation you won't want to miss. And remember, the Master Your Business podcast is here for you because of you. So don't forget to subscribe, rate and review the show on your favorite podcast platform. I absolutely cherish your feedback and love to know what resonates with you. So when you've listened to this episode, send me or Neve a message. Let us know which element of this conversation really landed with you. Your support, it enables us to bring more of this content that you love and the expert advice that you need to master your business journey. All right, let's dive into the show. Neve, welcome to the show. So thrilled to have you with us today. I'm absolutely so thrilled to be able to have you join us on the Master Your Business podcast. You're very welcome. Thank you so much, dear James. Delighted to be here. 
Listen, I know a lot about your backstory and I'm sure people will be interested in hearing it because you are now very much going to talk today about emotional connection, EFC. Why do I just tell people who are listening what that is and how you came to be doing this and all of the other amazing things that you're doing? Sure. So my background is I'm a chartered counselling psychologist. So I was working as a therapist for 20 years. I had a private practice for most of that. And I closed down that, I suppose, in 2019 and moved into coaching and retrained. And now I had been working in a, probably quite a coaching style for a while anyway. And alongside the one-to-one work, I've always done corporate work. So I've done lots of talks and trainings and webinars and workshops over the years and seen the inside of a lot of different offices, particularly in the well-being arena. And over the last few years, since since COVID, it was like a whole new business. I moved into working primarily with women in leadership, but also leaders in organizations. I had separate programs that I ran online throughout COVID and, and beyond. And so EMC is new for me, but also for this part of the world. So I've been training with a psychologist in California, Dr. Lola Gershvold in her evidence-based process called Emotional Connection, which is EMC. And really what that is a step-by-step roadmap to build and strengthen relationships in the workplace. So up until now, we've always been told emotions have no place in the workplace. (laughs) They keep them out. And yet we know that emotions come into the workplace all the time because we are human beings and we have emotions and they don't stop just because we're at work. And what tends to happen is that those emotions leak out and they get in the way of our relationships and very often there's conflict. And even when there's not conflict, there's often a disconnect. And when that's happening, people tend to disengage because if I'm working closely with you, for example, if you were my manager or you're a close colleague, if we're in a leadership team together, anything like that, if I have a falling out or a disconnect with somebody, I might feel like I don't trust them anymore. I might keep up the professional veneer and keep it all nicey nice so we can work together. But that that's going to be bothering me. Why am I not able to connect with you? Why? What's going on? What is she thinking? There's a lot of fear. There's often maybe shame. Um, and people don't have the skills. What do we do about this? It's work. We can't be talking about this. So they tend to brush it over and it grows. Of course, it's the pile under the carpet just grows. Resentments on the hearts grow and we're super sensitive now to each other as well. And as long as that is going on, that's taking up part of my brain that could otherwise be working and could be focusing on doing the job. So EMC really is about helping people, giving people the language and a structure to work through those difficult emotions. And it's a very strong way of building team engagement. So even where there's no prior conflict, it's a strong way of giving people skills to build that engagement. And of course, it also builds well-being because if you feel safe emotionally in your workplace and with your team and you have a language and you know that there's a trust and that you can allow yourself to be vulnerable, then... (laughs) Everything works better. Your performance improves. You're going to be more engaged. Your whole team is going to be more engaged. And really, it becomes an emotionally safe workplace as opposed to potentially toxic. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. There's so much value in everything you've said there. And I couldn't agree more. And and like earlier this year, I released a podcast episode saying why lean should be leaner because it's missing the empathy and the emotion and the relationships because they're the two most crucial things that grow our business. What grows our business is customers. And with the more customers we have, the more team and people that we need. And I think a lot of service providers who own or run their own businesses leave may not necessarily see themselves as leaders, perhaps, and mightn't think that they need those skills for clients or customers. And I mentioned to you before we started recording that I think a lot of women in per- in particular, sorry guys, I think a lot of women in particular are very good at the empathy and the emotion piece. But 
as you say, it's sometimes it's the things that take up parts of their brain and the thoughts of what does she think of me? What are they saying about me? And all of those things that they don't know. But yeah, so much to unpack in there. And you talked about it in the workplace, in the team and conflict. And I suppose just to bring that back a step, because that can be internal and external with clients and colleagues. Isn't that right? Conflict happens everywhere. Um, yeah. And I think this is such a huge, having worked now over 24 years between coaching and counseling, like to, I feel thrilled just to have come across this process that it's evidence-based. Right? So I'm not making it up. There's books written up and it's just, I can see the scope for this is massive because it's not just about the workplace. We have relationships and we have disconnects in our, all our relationships at home, in marriages, in any relationship, in, in schools, in community, everywhere. And that it's one of the chief reasons people come to therapy or, or coaching is difficulty in relationships. It causes huge stress. We're we're built to be, belong. It's one of our core human needs. We need a sense of belonging. We need to feel accepted. Um, we're not we're, we're not built to be hermits. There's eight, eight billion of us on this planet. So there's no kind of quiet mountain that you can go off to anymore. And really relationships and that emotional connection are a key resource for us. And also because of how we're like, if we look at the science behind it, even looking at, say, attachment theory, which has become really popular on, on all social media, really. But if you look at attachment theory in, and bring it into the workplace, we feel safe when we feel attached to somebody and that means that they're able to respond to us, engage with us and be present with us. And if you, whether you consider yourself a leader or not, if you're running your own business, I consider that as leading. Even if you don't have any employees, you're still leading, leading this product or this service out into the world. And you have to be a self-leader leading yourself. And so having those skills to be able to connect with others emotionally and build those relationships and knowing what to do when there's a disconnect because that's super important if we know that if a customer for example is dissatisfied say they've bought a product for you or you, you go to a restaurant and you're dissatisfied you're much more likely to go out and tell everybody about awful service that you got whereas if you're if if you were just had a good enough meal, you're not likely to tell anybody about it. And then on the other side, if you were wowed, if it was like wow, amazing service, then again you're more likely to tell lots of people about it. But that customer who could have potentially walked out there dissatisfied, if they can be won over, if they can feel like their dissatisfaction has been dealt with in an excellent way if they feel that they've been heard and that they've been valued then they're nearly better spreaders of your word than the person who had excellent service in the first place so even just taking that kind of customer service piece of information that we we know and then there's stats out there that again points to the importance of the, that connection that human connection that listening and tuning in and I guess even being tuned into the more vulnerable emotions that are there for somebody. I, again, so much in that and I completely agree. And the stats are this, because I know them offhand. They'll tell 17 people if they're dissatisfied. They'll tell seven if they're satisfied. Unless you ask them to tell more. So yeah, great example, Neve. And so let's say in terms of honing those skills and I agree with your statement as well if you're running your own business you're a leader I think everybody's leading you're leading your own life whether you're whether you're a parent yeah to a fur baby even as opposed to a different type of a baby you're still a leader you're the leader in your boardroom you're the leader at your kitchen table everybody's a leader what are the most important skills soft skills or otherwise that they can use to hone this I suppose, first of all, this approach looks at and helps us to break down different layers of emotions. So even that understanding of emotions and language around emotions is really important. We know that, that when you can name your emotion, that can reduce the intensity of it. 
So rather just happy, sad, good, bad, that if we can get more closely into the nuances of our emotions and can name them. And, and that's part of our job if we are parenting, not the fur baby, but <laughs> the children. You can help them to calm down by noticing, oh, OK, oh, you, you seem you're really mad now. And they'll, they'll correct you if you're wrong uh, in the same way that my clients would correct me if I get it wrong. Um, but having the words to, I suppose, recognize and get the nuance of your emotions is a really key skill in building emotional awareness and then also reducing the intensity of those emotions. Because if we don't have the language or the expression around that, we tend to act it out. And we so we're reacting rather than bringing awareness to and calmly responding. So I find personally that mindfulness is a great tool to help you separate out slightly so that you're not 100% in the emotion acting it out, but you can observe yourself and notice what you're feeling. There's also a really good app out there. Let me just check the name because it changed changed recently. How We Feel, which used to be the mood meter. It's now How We Feel. It's a free app and you can build your own emotional awareness through that. You just check in on your phone on the app a couple of times a day and Choose, first of all, whether you're feeling high positive or low positive, high negative or low negative, as in low energy kind of negative or positive. And then once you click on which of those quadrants, there's a whole choice of different emotion names that help you to identify how you're feeling. So that's there are easy places for people to start to build their awareness about their emotions. And awareness is always key. With EMC, we're looking at, first of all, there are the surface emotions. So the surface emotions are the emotions that we can almost, that we almost act out, that we see in other people's behavior. They're easily, they're easier to identify. So frustration, irritation, annoyance, upset, sense of betrayed, anger, like all of those kind of even shutting down, we can see those emotions almost as behavior. They're surface emotions and very often they're the emotions that people are aware of and, and they're the ones that they express easily. So if I'm annoyed, maybe I'll express this and then, or if I don't, it can leak out. But under the surface, there are other more vulnerable emotions happening. And those emotions, those vulnerable, softer emotions, we call them are often more difficult to share. So we have to feel safe in order to be able to share those emotions. But when we can begin to do that by sharing our softer emotions, we actually pull people closer to us. Whereas if we're only sharing our surface emotions, we often push people away. Mm. So it's not simply just about expressing my emotion, because if I'm angry, for instance, and I just express my anger, then I am probably going to be pushing people away. Not just that, but I may not even be aware that, dear, there's something you said has just pissed me off. And so I'm angry at you and I'm just letting you know I'm angry. Okay. Now, if I haven't brought awareness to my own process, it could be that actually you you were just the straw, the little straw that broke the camel's back because actually I've been angry since the mor- this morning since my partner said something to me. And then everything during the day has been building up until I exploded at you. But I'm going to think it's all you. It's all your fault. Without that awareness, without mm-hmm. shining the light in on ourselves. Emotional intelligence is a big area because there is that awareness and then there's also the expression. And what... While I've been working with emotional intelligence for years, I really feel like EMC now gives us a structured process to help people to become more emotionally tuned, to help them to build those emotional intelligence skills in a very structured, systematic way. It gives you a roadmap for that, where before you're maybe feeling your way along in the dark a little bit and trying like hundreds of different things. And okay, so let me just check, have I got this right? So what we're saying here then, really what would help leaders to develop and hone these skills are first and foremost, it's the awareness piece. Becoming aware around what their emotions are 
And that app, what was that app called again, Neve? I'll have to check it again. <laughs> Short term memories. It's called How We Feel. How We Feel. That sounds like yeah. a really useful way to be able to determine the language around what your emotions are. And I think, I don't know if this is something that you've come across a lot, but I, I actually, I'll come back and ask that question in a minute. It's just popped into my head as we're chatting. But And surface emotions then is the second thing, which is like the expression of emotions. It's often the emotion that's on the surface as opposed to the one that comes through. That makes complete sense when you say that. And I can even see that in myself as well. And sometimes it's if a client last week, for example, I had a complete wobbly because I'd had a day where a client reached out and they'd said, Dear Ja, we're actually not going to proceed with any further work. We're just so busy. We don't have the time. They've gotten so many clients and there's only two of them in the business that they just don't have the capacity to step away and do the work on their business. And I was like, okay, that's fine and whatever. And they're very happy with everything we've done. And then I had another client in the same day and I'd sent her some copy I'd written for her website and she'd come back and she was like, I just can't really, I'm not sure and on this sort of stuff. And I had, I that day with those two things happening in the day would have made me very wobbly me. But I had journaled that day about what my emotions were. And I think then I was able to have a surface emotion when this communication came in, but actually respond in a way that was, gave me clarity of thought and stuff like that. So I was able to regulate my emotions. But that brings me back to the first question. And I'm just sharing that story as an example, because I wouldn't always behave that way. Sometimes that would knock me off for four or five days if that happened in my business. And I know people listening will probably resonate with that as well. You get some feedback. And by the way, both clients have since said, actually, dear, we'll do this bit more with you. And then the other client had said, oh, now that I see it there, I'm happy with you. Had I responded in the way, if I had felt more vulnerable underneath the surface, it would have been a different story. But so coming back to what I want to get to in a long-winded version of that building awareness around emotions, and the language around emotions and how we feel. Is it common or in your experience, Dave, have you seen it a lot where I grew up in a house, for example, where you were told so your emotions are how you're feeling. You keep that at home. You don't talk about it outside of the home. And so actually finding the language and the words to describe how I feel. I still struggle with that today. And I'm in my 40s. Uh, is that common? Your experience? Yeah, absolutely, dear. Absolutely. And so many people, for a, a huge variety of reasons, didn't have that emotional kind of coaching support when they were growing up. Often because their parents didn't have the skills going back. You don't have to go back too far to when certainly, you know, the focus was on just surviving and getting it's nearly turned and come back around to that again getting food on the table, getting your kids educated, having shoes on their feet, that kind of thing. Whereas in more recent years and in our generation, there's such an emphasis on on parenting and being emotionally available for your child and feelings and being and mental health and all of that, which is long needed, of course. But we don't necessarily just have those skills. They're not, we weren't often brought up with them. And we'll be learning them for the rest of our lives. I don't think you come to this amazing. I've been in this business for 24, 25 years, working on myself for at least that long. But there's no point of arrival. And that doesn't mean that I don't ever lose it. I mean, if you saw me in Tesco when my kids were younger, I was not a good example of parenting. Um, we, I still can struggle emotionally with disconnects. Uh, if there's a heated exchange, if there's miscommunication and misunderstandings, that's why it's so important to have a way to deal with those things. Um, because we all struggle with them, whether we are, whether, whether you consider yourself to be highly emotionally intelligent or, or emotionally illiterate, there's a starting point for everybody. And it is just starting where you are, building that awareness. And it's having that willingness and often. Particularly if you have that kind of family background where 
actually the values we've been taught are anti-emotion almost or anti-awareness. It's examining those values because yes, our values are really important to who we are, but sometimes some of those values need to be re-examined. They may be working against you at this stage as an adult. They may have helped you to survive and thrive in your family in that context, but as an adult and you go out to the world, suddenly they could be working against you. It's like recognizing that's there, that maybe you were told, don't tell your left hand what your right hand is doing. Don't bring emotions outside the door. Don't bring them into work. But we know that the workplace loves us to be motivated, engaged, enthusiastic. They are emotions. They're positive emotions. They're high energy, positive emotions. And that's how we love to be, ideally, if we're at work. But of course, we also travel through low energy and we also travel through negative emotions at work. And how is that responded to? And if I, if, for example, if you are in a management position and you have a direct report that you rub off the wrong way or there's a difficult conversation to have, how do you maintain that relationship? That's really key because if you only have some negative feedback to give and you haven't been focused on building the relationship, then the chances are they're going to go away and that's going to work against them. They're less likely to be motivated. They may disengage. They may be resentful or hurt or angry, feel underappreciated. And, and that's counterintuitive, really, because that's not the purpose of that conversation was to help them to be better and, and, and you know, perform better and bring up their performance and effectiveness. And I guess so, that, that same scenario applies with um, a business owner and client relationship. Yeah, exactly. As a business owner, how do you respond when somebody comes to you with a difficult conversation? How do you, if somebody has a complaint or they feel like, first of all, we know that if somebody actually brings that to us, they're giving us an opportunity. But the chances are for, for most people, they might go into either a defensive mode um, or they feel, yeah, or you see them in the it's, oh no, oh shit, what's happening? Oh no. And we go into fear. We go into fear and depending on our ability to be aware around that, we may not react or respond the way the customer needs us to and, uh, or the way that we might look back and might not be so proud of how we react at the time. Um, those skills are, are huge. And like, branding is a big part of your business, dear. To, like how we respond when we're under pressure in these awkward situations and these stressful situations. And, and let's face it, since 2020, Near every business has had to flex and adapt and change and grow. It's constant change and constant pressure. And how we respond to that is part of our brand because it's what people feel from you. And if you are somebody who you mentioned earlier, sometimes that people may work very operationally or may not take into account the, the you know, relationships or emotions. And yes, that's part of what people buy into. Lots of people offer the same product. What makes them buy from you? It's yeah. a feeling. Yeah. A connection. It's a trust. Yeah. That's, yeah. They're all emotions. And then it comes from relatability and empathy and uh, you being authentic as well. And you said it yourself, Niamh, don't bring emotions outside the door. That's how I was brought up. And then I worked in corporate for 20 years and running my own business and marketing my own brand and the type of marketing that I teach clients to do and, and help clients do, it brings emotion into the equation, but often it's something they've never done before. And again, it's the language around the emotions. That's a lot of the work that I do with them. But what are your thoughts in terms of some specific strategies that professional service providers and anyone listening to the show could use to improve their communication, be it with customers in their sales or marketing or as part of their brand? What could they do? So 
I, I suppose my number one piece now is EMC, the Emotion Connection Strategy. And there's an online masterclass. It's, it probably will take four to six weeks of your time. But for somebody who's a coach, for example, that's a really good investment because you're learning those skills that then you're going to have them with your clients and you can use the skills that you learn with your clients. And there's lots of practical skills that you learn there, as well as then your any relationships benefiting and your business benefiting as a result. For, for others who would not be using it necessarily in their work, there's still, there's still a lot of skills to learn that will help you because we all live with other people and work with other people. In a very practical way, if I was to give maybe three tips, three practical things even, Probably the first one is coming from mindfulness. Just stop and pause before you respond. When we, the danger is if we don't learn how to pause and slow things down, then we just go into react mode and often we're not proud of how we might react. So if you want to be able to respond more consciously, you do have to slow things down, often take a breath. And, and bring your awareness to, I notice I'm having a reaction to what that person just said. Breathe. Okay, how do I want to respond? Rather than just going into the action. So that's the first. The second piece then is in relation to others and in our relationships when we're working with people. If you're a leader, if you're an employer, if you're a manager, if you're a team member, it's looking at, at safety and how can you create safety? And so with with EMC, they use this A or E, are you there for me? So a worker wants to know, is their manager there for me? Are you there for me? And A or E is accessible, responsive and engaged. So if we can practice being A or E, accessible, responsive and engaged, that creates more safety with our people. And the third thing there is a reminder that the sharing the softer emotions pulls people closer. So that we know there's huge amounts written, for example, by Brené Brown and all the research that she's done on vulnerability. And there's a lot spoken about the importance of vulnerability. People still really hate that idea and maybe don't understand the value of it. You have to be safe. You have to feel safe in order to be vulnerable. And so that's why safety is the second step before this. But if you can even open up a little bit and take that risk with somebody, is it gives them permission then to be vulnerable. It paves the way. And even if they don't open up and allow themselves to be vulnerable with you on that day, they know now that you're a safer person to come to and they may come back when they have those vulnerable feelings and they're ready. So it'll still be on their terms, but it pulls people closer. It lets them see the more human side of you, that you're not just this super achiever or super strong person that they can't relate to if they, because everybody struggles. And so if they can never see the cracks, if they can never see your struggles, if you seem to always be coping and you're the rock, you're the be strong type, that can make it maybe harder for them to relate to you and they'll find their way to somebody else instead. So allowing ourselves to be vulnerable when we feel safe and even taking a little risk sometimes with that, testing out, that actually can just bring relationships to a whole other level. Fantastic. What amazing tips, Neve. And I have a question about that last one. So sharing the softer emotions to be vulnerable. I think sometimes leaders, particularly as business owners, we don't want to be vulnerable with the people who are working for us because we want to seem like we have everything under control. And don't worry, your pay will be in at the end of the month where it might be like, oh crap, how am I going to pay the, this month's wages? And so you might not want to let people know what's really going on behind the scenes or that you were up on hours of the night freaking out about the stuff that's happening behind the scenes. Like, 
is there a boundary or a fine line between that leader and direct report or direct report might be the language that some listeners might use. But if you have a VA who is highly involved in your business, a virtual assistant, or maybe you've got a part-timer or a contractor or a few people on your team, somebody that you really, you know, you do work well with and trust. Where is the fine line or the boundary or is there one? Should there be one? Yeah, it's a really good question, Deirdre, because I think absolutely. So if you're in an employer position or you've contractors or whatever, kind of, as you're naming there, sometimes that support needs to be from elsewhere, whether, it, whether it's from your network or you have a coach or a mentor or a therapist or a colleague. So that your key stress can be vented maybe to somebody safe to help you so again having that safe space that you go to and this is why a coach can be so valuable and that can help you then to build your awareness and decide what approach you want to bring to whether it's your VA or your team or whoever you're working with your direct reports now that doesn't so you're not necessarily going to go into those people and go oh my god I'm so stressed I don't know if the company's going to survive past the week or I don't know if I can pay you because there is responsibility and you could put, push those people into total panic mode. And now it's going out and screaming that, that, that this bank is going bankrupt and everybody takes their money out. And now it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. As a leader, part of our responsibility is to, to hold that boundary, to manage some of the stress and to protect our people to some level from some of the stresses that we have to, if, as a business owner. That's your problem, not theirs often. And still, there are so many different opportunities to allow them to see you as the human being. And it could be sometimes personal stuff. Or it could be what's happening in the news and in the world and that they see that, that you don't have it all sorted and that you're feeling for the people of Gaza, the people of Israel or whatever's going on in the world right now kind of thing. That, so there's, we have countless opportunities in our day-to-day -day times to, I think, al allow ourselves to show our humanity, show our compassion and show our vulnerability when, or just, they don't need to know the details even necessarily, but it can be just, gosh, I've noticed I'm really under stress at the minute and I hope I'm not biting your heads off because it has nothing to do with you and that's for me but I just want to let you know that I haven't been sleeping well for example and or going through perimenopause and again just sharing with you that yeah sometimes I feel like I'm struggling and I just, it's just me being human right now so you might share appropriate vulnerabilities but there is a boundary in place because it's not about them having to take care of you because it is as a leader you're still it's still your job to more take care of them thanks for that and i think that's really valuable because sometimes when we're working really closely with people or maybe you're sitting side by side with somebody in the office all day every day you can't develop very close relationships but there's still that dynamic that you need to be mindful of i think and that can happen as relationships grow and evolve where you feel very safe and very trustful of the person. But I think it's important that there's still boundaries and just knowing where they are and when not to cross them. But Niamh, let me check if I got those three tips because they are invaluable. So stop and pause before you respond to something that maybe is difficult or triggers you in some way where you can feel that emotion surfacing. And I always say for this is don't send that email when you're feeling that way because you can never take it back. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Oh. It's honest. Again, slow it all down, slow it all down because, and if you, even if it isn't that, maybe you're just having a bad day. Maybe you're feeling like that day that you had a week ago where a couple of things were happening on top of each other. You sit on it for a day. You have a good night's sleep and you might feel differently about it tomorrow or you start getting some good news. And again, you can you have a perspective on it. So even to give you that perspective, people don't need to be a spun respond to it just like that. You'd be better off, particularly with emails sitting on it. If the person's in front of you and you are feeling under pressure to respond, 
even the fact that you feel under pressure or that you're feeling pushed into something is a clue that you want to say no or that you need more time. And so I would, again, buy more time, say, listen, that's not something that I can just decide on the spur of the moment it's, or I don't have that information to hand right now or let me come back to you on that over the next few days. I just don't have it at the you know tip of my head right now. So have a little phrase that's natural for you to buy yourself more time. Yeah, if you find yourself having a strong reaction, breathe into it and tune in. And you might even know, I, I notice I'm having a bit of a reaction to that, so I don't want to respond to you right now in case it comes out wrong. Because mm. actually, it could come out wrong. I could say something that I really don't want to say. So just can you let me come back to you on that when I... And I've had a bit of space to, to think about it more clearly. Yeah, Excellent. that's powerful, really powerful. And then the other thing it said was create safety. And I love the example you gave. So it's, are you there for me? And then you're talking about being accessible, responsive and engaged. Well, you explain a little bit more about, about those, the accessible, responsive and engaged and how that applies maybe to a customer in that customer relationship. So, yeah, so whether you're a customer or whether you're an employee, you want to know that the person is there for them. Are you there for me? Can I trust you? Do you value me? They're the needs that are there. And so for us to embrace that approach, is it's making ourselves accessible, first of all, whether it's to our customer or to our direct report, for instance. It doesn't mean you have to be available 24-7. Of course, there are still boundaries to all of that, but they should be able to get to you. They should be able to have that conversation if they need to, particularly if they're struggling in some way or have a difficulty. They need to know that we're accessible and can then be responsive. Listening is a huge part of that. Tuning in and really just, again, sitting on your reaction, slowing it down and just listening and making sure that you're really hearing the other person. That is really powerful. Before you jump into fix it mode, because that when we're under pressure, we tend to try and operate really speedily. We think we we know exactly what you're talking about uh, and we jump into fix it mode and we haven't necessarily listened. And so whether you fix it or not, if the person doesn't feel heard, often they'll have to keep going and they'll want more of your time. And it ends up being longer in the long run. So oh, that's a great one. Actually, I call that solutionitis. We get solutionitis. It's because we really want to help them, but actually by not listening or asking more questions to check for understanding, we develop solutionitis. That I do it. I do it often and my intentions are good, but then the fix isn't as good as it could have been because I didn't listen or ask more questions to understand better. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. we have to make sure that, and sometimes they're not even looking for a fix. They are just looking to be acknowledged, to be heard, because that helps them to feel validated and, and accepted. So, and that's hugely important to the relationship. So without you having to do anything, you have to first be. And so it's just being, the R is part of being. Being with the person first before you jump into doing mode. If you jump into doing mode too quickly, you've, you may have lost them altogether. And certainly we all do it. And we've all had that experience too. And I've worked with mentors in the past who I just felt didn't listen to me enough. And so they're giving all this wonderful advice that isn't a good fit for me. I can't take it. It's a waste of time. And as a coach, it's hugely important that I spend enough time listening and, as you mentioned, asking the right questions and delving in there to explore, to make sure that when or if you come up with a solution or an offer or whatever it might be, that it's going to be the right fit for the person. So that's the responsive and engaged, really engaging with the person where they're at, with their engaging with them so that it's safe for them to have those emotions, whatever those softer emotions might be, so that they come down out of the surface of the anger, frustration, annoyance, and feel safe to come into the vulnerable emotions because that's where it's really at. And if those vulnerable emotions aren't heard, 
then the person very often will go back out into the surface emotions given out or whatever else they might be doing until they feel acknowledged for what's going on really inside. I think you've really tapped into something there with that in terms of that safety space, actually. And where I see that happening in my client engagements is actually very early on in that first interaction where it's potentially a sales call. And it's really asking those questions to understand what is it that they're looking for help with and how that's making them feel. And giving them that space because your third tip, which was sharing the softer emotions, I think if you do that, you listen to understand. You mentioned then it brings up vulnerability. People feel more comfortable being vulnerable. They open up and they'll take that risk with you. But really what that it means then is they trust you to share it with you. And yes. if you've asked those questions in the first instance without jumping into solutionitis, which say me a compa, I do it and do it. And uh, not always, but sometimes I do it. When we jump into that solutionitis, that could be the thing that maybe causes them to step back and close off and not decide to work with you. Because that you said it earlier, people buy from people and it's about that emotional connection. Is there any way in the youth that if you feel you're having a conversation with somebody and maybe you just don't feel that connection, that there's a disconnect somewhere, is there a way without being manipulative or anything that's like icky that makes people feel sleazy, is there a way where they can maybe try to channel it back and win so they can create that sort of relationship and connection? So... Are you talking now perspective of perspective from the perspective of say yourself in a in one of those calls? Can you pull back the client? Is there a way of winning back the client when you experience a disconnect? I think let's say imagine that you've jumped into solutionitis, for example, and you're trying to fix it without having maybe listened and heard enough, and you just feel that there is not a connection there, and that can be at any stage in a relationship with anyone. What kind of tools or skills can you use to trigger something in your brain that says oh hold on here now shut up and listen or ask questions instead of doing all this talking like I feel I'm doing right now <laughs> how can you do that yeah so again it, it's awareness it's and it's and once you notice then you can do something about it so if you suddenly notice the sound of your own voice, for example, or you notice maybe from an expression that you're picking up from the listener that something you've said has maybe pushed you off track or if you can feel them almost withdrawing. And, and again, this pattern of disconnect, there's a withdrawer and there's a pursuer very often. So the thing about it is when we feel somebody withdraw that we often go into pursuer mode as a result because and. And both people like in a disconnect are the intent there is to save the relationship. So sometimes a person is withdrawing because they're afraid to say something that will threaten the relationship. So they actually, OK, I'm just going to pull back now and that will keep the relationship intact. The pursuer often feels that withdrawing happen and almost goes into panic mode and unconsciously then is chasing. I think of it like Pac-Man chasing and the other person running away. So at some point that might step and it can turn the other way too. But that's part of the, the negative cycle that we can ca get caught up into and, and the EMC training helps us to recognize that. So for if you notice yourself gone into that pursuer mode or if you notice yourself withdrawing from the person, it's again, it's to stop and step out of that negative cycle. So you have to notice it first and then you can pause, slow it down, and, and slow the whole conversation down, really, and wonder about that or maybe bring a curiosity to that. Can I just check in with you? How are you doing right now, actually? I, I'm, I'm not sure we're still on the same page. Something as simple as that. You might ask them to a question that gets them back engaged talking about themselves or their issue or gives you some clarity. So it, it, it Usually you'll have to, like if it is in a sales call, you'll have to maybe change tack because there's a sense that you've lost them somewhere along the line. There's a disconnect. Now, sometimes there's just 
not a connection from the word go, particularly if this is your first time meeting somebody, they're sizing you up, you're sizing them up. The, the, there is that kind of inherent background question is, are we a good fit to work together? And it doesn't matter how excellent I am as a coach or as a therapist or anything else. And I, I don't offer therapy anymore, but it was the same. I'm not going to be the right coach or therapist for everybody who comes in front of me. And, and part of you having that chemistry call or the initial kind of sales meeting is to ascertain how we good match to work together. Because not everybody is going to be ready, willing and able and a good match to work with you. And sometimes you have to make that call. Now, what I like to be able to do if I find that, say, if you were coming to me, Deirdre, and it's in that initial call and you're looking for something and that's, if it's counseling, I don't offer that anymore. Well, I can recommend, I can give you some names so I, I can still be of help to you. So you still go away having a positive experience of me, even if there's no business for me in it. I would still prefer that you go away happy and work and going in the right direction of who might be the right person for you. I love that. So I love that. And I think that's so important. And that, that can result in referrals back for you as well, because you, somebody's left you having had a positive experience, because even though they came to you for help in one way, you've helped them in another. That's okay too. And needs something that, that I just really don't touch on very quickly, if possible, is let's say in terms of employees and employees engaging with clients, how can a business owner or a leader support the emotional connection that an employee would have with clients? So some of that is going to come down to two things come to mind straight off. First of all, if you are the employer or the leader in what, whatever the, this, the category might be, it's your duty to create a, an emotionally safe place for your employees so that they are going to be at their best. And then they are more likely, that second piece then, to be able to have the skills to pass that on to the customer or to operate on that level with the customer. Now, some of that comes down to recruitment, but actually a huge amount comes down to how you operate your team as a leader, the environment that you set up, the safety that you create and the language that you use. And that's a huge point of bringing EMC over to Ireland and Europe and UK because it's non-existent at the moment, is to, to give people those skills, to help leaders and in particular leaders. We train people at all levels, but it is particularly leaders who need to be able to implement this and learn these skills so that when I'm taken out of the equation, that those skills keep expanding and, and growing and are kept there so that the culture changes over time. Because safety needs to be part of that culture. And of course, psychological safety has been written about and researched and talked about. It's still not happening in so many instances. And that needs to be part of the culture and people need to have those key skills in order to do that. Again, I would say the responsibility falls primarily with the leader first off. And then if their employees are receiving that and they're coming to work and feeling that, that comes through them to the customer and they're learning those skills then with each other, they're practicing with each other and that comes through to the customer. So everybody benefits then because um, you're going to have higher engagement because they're going to be able to focus on the job because there aren't these distractions of awkward conversations and nitpicking and distrust and fear and shame and everything else that can come into play yeah. when we're not emotionally safe. Fantastic. I, I really see the value in this in terms of that emotional piece and not being afraid to use it or to, to talk about it and to be vulnerable yourself in terms of sharing those emotions, I think is really great. And, and I know some clients that I have, they're fantastic at this without realizing it. They do it naturally and it's lovely to see the cultures that they've created in their workplaces. It's fabulous. So Neve, if you were to sum up some of the benefit of EMC, the Emotional Connection Strategy for employers or leaders to 
to go ahead and, and do this in their business or to bring it in, what would you say are the top two or three benefits of having it? First of all, engagement. So because you're creating safety and you're learning a, a common language, really, you are able to build engagement. And recently, even we're recording this in October, there's a lot around mental health in the workplace. Um, having a safe in work environment contributes massively to mental health and being. And when you're feeling well and you're positively, you have those more positive emotions at work, your relationships are thriving as a result of all of this. All of that feeds your bottom line. It impacts on performance and effectiveness and engagement. So they're all massive benefits of working with the MC and bringing the MC in. It has the potential, I really think, of turning a toxic work environment into an emotionally safe and healthy environment. And every ben everybody benefits from that. From a conflict point of view also, that's often how somebody like me would be brought into an organization where there is a conflict in, in a key relationship. I'm not going to be, I'm not likely to be invited in for a conflict on a factory floor. It's going to be a key relationship in a senior leadership team, on a board. They're really important relationships. And if there's a disconnect, then the whole board or the whole leadership team can struggle and suffer. And again, giving people the skills to repair and strengthen those relationships where there has been a disconnect means that they now have the skills going forward for future disconnects because disconnects are going to happen. We're going to, none of us, no matter how emotionally intelligent and wonderful, we're still human, we're, this disconnects are still going to happen. There's still going to be misinterpretations and miscommunications happening sometimes, but they can be repaired much more quickly with the right tools so that the damage isn't done and that people aren't going home building up on that and talking to others about it and stirring the pot and there's resentment and there's everything else, which we're very familiar with because that's what's happening currently in every workplace. Show me the workplace where there isn't conflict and disconnect. So that's often why somebody like me might be called in the first place. But the idea would be not for me. My ideal is to work with a leader or leaders who are interested in being innovative and pioneering and being proactive, really, in looking after their people, looking after their team and giving them the best possible chance um, for high performance. Well, it's really it comes down to potential, re helping people to reach their potential. At the end of the Fantastic. Oh, my God. The benefits of this go on. And I think, why are we so afraid? Like, why are we so afraid to be open about our emotions in the workplace? Like, why is that? Do we think we'll be judged? Is it like, I know in my career, no matter how stressed I was when I worked in the bank, I would never say to my line manager or anybody, God, it's so stressful. Because that word, it would be here or you'll never get your promotion if you say you're stressed. You can't handle it. Yeah. Yeah, so people are, and that's a lack of safety mm -hmm. because there is, because, there, there, because of the judgment and the fear of judgment. Um, and that has typically been the way, but what happens then is that person who won't say that they're stressed is now out on sick leave, on a stress leave. So it, it builds up to such an extent and it's not spoken about. And then you have to tell your company because now you're out sick leave. I mean, it's a much bigger problem for the companies. So that's how, and I still see it in a lot of organizations where there's just quite a difficult culture where being vulnerable is just anathema to the culture. It's, oh my God, no way. And, and there are probably people listening to this, dear Joe, who are going, there's no way I could do that in my organization. There's no way I would just be run over. And that's a truth in some organizations. And, and so certainly as an employee that you're not going to be able to create that change, which is why I'm interested in working with the leaders where the change can happen from the top down, because it has to happen from the top down. There has to be safety created first. Otherwise, yeah, your promotion, depending on where you work, could be under question just by sharing your vulnerability. So there has to be safety in order for there to be vulnerability. But we know the research is so strong to show that rather than this kind of macho culture where everybody pretends to be strong and to have no cracks and then 
gets spat out the other side with burnout and sick leave and all sorts of stress related illnesses, physical and mental. Instead of having that kind of extreme, if we can come more into the middle where we acknowledge the humanness of our people and acknowledge the emotions that are there that we just have been hiding up until now and find, create safety around that, then actually you can work through that so that they're not such a big issue. And instead of get people getting spat out, then you're working together and, and moving through the difficulty, a shared difficulty, so you're not having to have that burden. Because some of those more vulnerable emotions are, I feel maybe isolated because I can't share this. I feel weak. I feel like a failure because everybody else seems to be doing fine. So actually, part of the stress is just having to do that on your own. If yeah. you can share that, it's now not as big a burden. If mm. you can recognize, if your leader goes, oh gosh, I'm so glad you shared that with me, Deirdre. Thank you. I can really appreciate that. How can I help you? How can I support you? Gosh, even having that much acknowledgement sometimes goes a long way to actually lightening your heart. Agreed so much. And oh my gosh, the leaders who get this, it's really going to shift cultures. I really believe that, Neve. I can really see the value in, in everything you've talked about today. And I see it as an incredible opportunity for small business owners because they're not, they don't have these institutions yet where there's a culture that's toxic potentially. But as they grow, they have this incredible opportunity to bring in and integrate emotional connection strategies into their business as they grow and develop. And as you say, it's innovative. It could be the differentiator for them where they have these connections. And that comes back to the question you, you say, you know, in terms of kind of self-reflection, do you value me? And from a, a customer experience perspective, the reason people stay and remain clients is because they feel valued. That equally applies to employees. And in, where it's so difficult to get employees right now, creating that culture, even in a small business and that sense of making people feel valued because you have an emotional connection. Powerful. It's so powerful. I really believe that. Neve, as we wrap up, tell us what's coming up for you over the coming months. It probably be February or March when this episode airs. So what's coming up for you at that time? And what's coming up for you in the coming months? And what any final words or anything you'd like to share as we wrap up? Well, first of all, thank you. So yeah, I'm my first step really because this is so new to Ireland is to just get the and to Europe and UK is to get the word out there and to share the information to educate people. So I'm quite happy to give free webinars and am at the moment and would be for the foreseeable on LinkedIn, for example. So people could follow me on LinkedIn, Neve Hannan, H A N and A N. Similarly, if if your listeners would like to subscribe on my website, it's nevehannon.com and there's just a monthly newsletter so they'll find out about up and coming events or different resources that I'm sharing. Um, happy to be invited to speak at people's events or conferences, for example, about this because I really just feel like it. there is, we're all human beings, we all depend on relationships. Um, there's the sciences behind this, those attachments that we build, those bonds that we build, when they're not there, we struggle. And it's helping people to understand that there is a solution and it's here now. A lot of it is beginning with education and helping people to just hear about this. For any of your USA listeners or North American listeners, the services has been over there for quite a while, so they should check out emcleaders.com emcleaders.com that there's loads of information there and again for any of your listeners in Europe I'm the person to contact but that website also gives lots of information Dr. Lola Gershwin's book is available through that the masterclass is available online through that so yeah I suppose it's just to to help people to hear about it and to learn about it and I'll be available for a company near you <laughs> at a company near you so just get in touch if people want to have a conversation having listened to this if it's per if it perks your interest if you would like to learn a little bit more i'm always open to just having a conversation that's over zoom or whatever suits 
Fantastic. Neve, thank you so, so much for joining us on the Monster Your Business show. I think there's so much value packed in everything that you've talked about today. And I think there's probably going to be a lot of people going away thinking about emotions in their workplace, their business a lot more after today. So thank you so much. Really great seeing you. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Deirdre. Wow, what an incredibly insightful conversation that was. A huge thank you to Neve Hannon for joining us today on the Master Your Business podcast and for sharing the power of emotional connection in a business setting. I don't know about you, but to me, it's clear that the journey to a successful business is a blend or our ability to be able to be human, to connect and to understand what our emotions are and to spot what the emotions are of the people who are around us. And that includes our clients. Neve's expertise and practical tips from learning to pause and reflect when emotions run high to creating an environment where it's safe to be vulnerable and authentic. They're not just strategies that you can use in the workplace, but they're essential life skills that you can use at home, with your family, with your kids. And uh, I don't know if you're playing sports anywhere, these skills have the power to transform your life your workplace, your team, and your total approach to business. So to you, our dedicated listeners of the Master Your Business podcast, whether you're a solopreneur, whether you're managing a growing team or nurturing the seeds of a future global organization, remember this, your emotional intelligence is a cornerstone of your business foundation. So it's innovative to foster this culture where emotions are acknowledged, shared and respected. And as we've learned from Neve today, this culture, it creates happier workplaces, but that's not all. It drives trust, engagement, and ultimately by being human, it helps you drive success. So I really hope you're walking away today from this episode feeling inspired and equipped with new tools to strengthen your emotional connections and enrich your business journey. Remember, these soft skills Neve discussed, they may not always be easy to master, but they are invaluable in shaping resilient and thriving businesses. You'll find the link to the app Neve mentioned in the show notes, along with the links to the EMC leaders and Neve's own website. So head over to the show notes to get your hands on those. Folks, that wraps up another episode of the Master Your Business podcast. Thank you for sharing your time with us, your insights, your journey, and your growth. They're why we're here. That's why we have this show. And we are totally committed to bringing you conversations that spark your transformation, help you master your business, and achieve success. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on your preferred podcast channel. Share it with your friends and your colleagues, your business bestie, whoever you're on this entrepreneurial journey with. Your support helps us grow and helps us to continue to bring you the best of content and incredible speakers like Neve today. Stay connected, stay inspired, and remember we're in this together, mastering the art of successful businesses by simply being human. Until next time, take care.